Hey, it's Jamie, and welcome to a selects edition of Eventual Millionaire. This is where we go back and find the best of the best, the ones that you've loved from the past six seven years. We've been doing this a long time and there's some amazing interviews with amazing guests that you have not seen yet. So we are bringing them back. It is the Selects Edition. Let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have Nigel Eccles. Now, he's run a company called FanDuel, ended up selling that company and starting what I love, which is a new company called Flick. He's co-founding it, and it's a podcast community app. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. When I was doing your research, uh, FanDuel is amazing, number one, and I want to talk about the community side of that, yeah. but you didn't even do fantasy, fantasy sports when you started that company, and then you're in random yeah. podcasting. So tell me a little bit about how you get into uh, the industries that you go into. Uh, how it starts. Um, uh, you know, in both instances, it, it sort of, it starts with an idea about what people might want to do. And what kind of moves around is who are the people, <laughs> I guess. So, you know, with FanGill, we thought the, the company we had before was a prediction market. And we thought, hey, people want to make predictions about things that are going to happen. And that was totally true. And our, our earlier product was a product called HubDub. But what we found out that the people who wanted to do that the most were sports fans. And they wanted to make predictions around sports. And fantasy sports is a great way to make predictions about, about sports. Like these are the players who are going to really overperform. These are the players who are going to underperform. And with Flick, when I left Fangio two years ago, I had this idea that um, people wanted to find a way to connect you know, connect and form communities with other people with similar interests, right? And the reason I thought that was because we saw that with Fangio, we built this community around fantasy sports, and we had to build all those tools ourselves, the message boards, the forums, the the chat, and we were like, that seems crazy but to build that. Surely there should be a product that allows people to connect with other people themselves. And so we had that thesis, and then we went on this little journey to find out where those people were, and we, you know, we looked at esports for a while and gamers, and we uh, looked at a couple of other categories, and we ended up with podcasts and said, actually, there's, um, uh, I don't, uh, the number of, so it's half the U.S. population listens to podcasts, so they feel part of a community, but they don't really have any way to connect with those other uh, people in the group, and that's the idea with Flick was, let's help them connect with the other listeners. See, I love I love that you said esports because there's so many trending communities right now, and I feel like no offense to us poor sad podcasters, we get sort of left in the in the dust, right, with Apple and totally. everything else. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the tools that was part of the reason we came to podcasting because we went into po uh, esports and we what we discovered was the tools that they have in uh, esports like Discord and Twitch are really good. <laughs> and, you know, when I came to, when we looked over at podcasting, we were like, oh boy, you know, this this is not, this is a, a poorly served uh, community. And so if we could build something that actually was like a Twitch for podcasting, that would be such an amazing experience. Okay. So tell me more about the actual program and product. Because I agree with, it, it, <laughs> I remember back in the day I was going like, why can't we, why can't we make this connection? I'm a geek. I have a degree in computers. This just yeah. doesn't make any sense. So, so tell yeah. me a little bit more about, about what the app actually does so everyone can hear. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, I, I guess a way is to, um, to think about it is, it is like uh, if you're on Slack or Discord, so Slack, uh, people use a lot of work. It's a way to communicate with a large number of people. And, and so it's like that, but it's built for podcasts. Um, and so within the app, you can listen to the podcast like on another one of the dozens of other players, but you can also send, uh, do sort of text-based chat either with the hosts or with other people who are in that community. Um, and so when you come into the app, you basically either you can select play podcast. I'll play the most recent episode. And even when you're playing it, you can immediately go into one of the topics and someone's discussing the most recent episode and they're chatting away about that or they're chatting away about their job. People are chatting about work, weather, their pets, whatever the issue is. And so that that's and that's all captured within a native app. So it's an iOS or Android app. 
And so what's the goal with, I mean, I kind of get it, but mm -hmm. tell me what your goal is in regards to sure. community, uh, creating those communities. Yeah, so our goal, and the, the, one thing to be clear about the way we've done it is, there's kind of two ways we thought we could do this. One way to do this was to try and sort of bring every podcast on and then have community on every podcast. And we've seen some people try to do that, and that doesn't work very well because you go in and you go to a really big podcast and you say, wow, it's great, I love this podcast, and there's like one other person there and there's no community. And so the way we're doing it is, is that we're just going podcast by podcast. Now that might seem slower, but it's a much better experience in that we will take take snapback sports, it's a, uh, it's a fairly small uh, sports podcast focused on people sort of in late teens, early 20s. Um, we brought them onto the platform. They have about 8,000 people in their group. Um, so it is a super active, busy, exciting group. And so they bring their fans into that group and engage with them. Um, and so what we're doing is then going from there to sort of other sports podcasts. And so that's what their intention is to do, is to basically go podcast by podcast, bringing them onto the platform and only bringing them onto the platform if the hosts are saying, yeah, I'm going to actively engage with my group here. Um, and so and so that what that means is the listener has a really good experience because they're saying, hey, come and join the group so they can actually connect with the host and they know there'll be a vibrant community. So that's that's what we're doing. Yeah, there's so many times where I go in and I'm like, oh, there's three people. Oh, yeah. You know, so, like, well, yeah. there goes that, you know, that's, and you want you want to have an amazing, thriving community, but it's it's kind of hard to build, too. And I know that's sort of an expertise of yours. So what do you suggest for their podcasters? I know a lot of podcasters listen <laughs> to this show or business owners in general. How do we build this community so that it does feel thriving and not sad? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a really good point. And, you know, podcasters start at a good place in that you have an audience, you know, you have a following but you don't have a community. And, and a community, in, in my definition, is where you have one-to-one -one interactions between either the host and the community and between the community and other members of the community. That's when it becomes what you describe as community and not just a, a listenership. Um, I've interviewed uh, some of the best podcasters for doing this, some of the best sort of site owners, um, and I, I've written them up. Actually, if you go to flickapp.com, there's a uh, there's a series of blog posts that are interviews with people like Jim Harold, who's a par paranormal podcast. He's got a brilliant community. Um, uh, there's an interview with um, Joe Bryant, who runs Football Guys. He's built this community up over 10 years. It's all premium. So every one of his people on his site pay uh, to be on Football Guys. Um, so. And, and that's sort of where we're really interested. Like, it's one thing to have a community, but when you have a community that actually pays for your content, that's get really interesting. They're really engaged. And so I wrote these up. And what I discovered through all the interviews I did was the um, there was good and bad news about a building community. So here's the good news. It's, it's actually not that hard. <laughs> it's not that sophisticated. There isn't really any kind of secret to it. The bad news is it takes a lot of work. Um, oh, and man. It, yeah, it takes, you know, it takes time and investment. It takes you know, every one of these. And so, for example, Jim Harold, good example. I said, how did you build community? He said, by exchanging emails with my followers every day. And so he would maybe do like 100 emails a day. People say so he does paranormal. People who have experiences, he would email him. He would reply. Um, and then people would become lifelong fans, right? Because he's the host of the show. Um, uh, Jim Bryant of Football Guys, very similar. He he built it on email. Um, people, he would, he's got a fantasy sports advice site. And people would want to know, like, should I pick this guy or this guy? And, and Joe would be the guy that kind of would pull that together. But now he's got this really, really vibrant community. Um, and so pretty much there's that that's sort of one set true crime obsessed is another one that's built a community i don't think they were so much email based but they uh, they actually did it on facebook um uh, but they definitely did it with a lot of engagement uh, a lot of engagement they were very much out there in the audience and the audience sort of felt a connection with them and that sort of built up that community Darn, I wanted it to be like some secret sauce where you have one moderator that does these 12 things and then therefore right so mo moderators are, are definitely a core part of it. Within the Flick app, we have different tiers. And so we have the hosts. And then they can uh, nominate people to become moderators. 
And what we typically find in these communities is that those moderators become very important. They're, they're typically just members of the community that are really want to help contribute and make it work. Um, and so that is definitely a core part of it. But in all of these really engaged communities, the hosts are very engaged. Okay, so questions on that because because yeah. it is it seems like especially being a host the time factor makes a difference the how often you post like are there any um, strategies in terms of we used to do like weekly wins Wednesdays and some of our group stuff and some people are like eh. do you have any like protocols for what like really gets people engaged versus not especially if it's not always the host that can be in starting the conversation yeah um, it's interesting it does depend it depends which is worse than <laughs> Give you a couple of examples. Um, one of our groups, is Snapback Sports, they do something called Wallpaper Wednesday. Um, so what they do is they, um, the host basically gets, and I think people send him like sort of sports wallpapers for your phone, and so he publishes them all on Wednesday, and people go bananas for them. That makes so sense. they're they're it's something that, you know, it's something that is a good that is effectively free but is, is sort of valuable to the community. And so, and then, then he also does as an event, he doesn't do it as a, it's not every day, it's always on a Wednesday. Um, and so I actually even think the original, the original cat memes on the internet started off on 4chan and that was always on, on Saturday and it was catter day. And so this idea of having an event around a particular topic of something that's engaging to your community, that's, that's what we've seen works really well. So is it like, what do you mean by an event? Because we do podcasts. Is it like a Facebook Live or what do you mean by event? Yeah, it's sort of like, a, like a live. So within this period, we're doing this certain thing, right? And the, what is my community really interested in? And so, for example, for this podcast, what you might want to do is, is, is do live and say, and live doesn't mean that you would have to be necessarily on video or, or on audio, but you could say between 8 and 9 p.m. on this day, I'm going to be doing live Q&A about questions about your business mm -hmm. or about marketing. That's something that becomes an event. How do you know that's what is in my plan for 2020? <laughs> Man, <laughs> good job. All right. Well, apparently yeah. I'm on the right track. Thank you for telling me that then too. Because because I do, it does feel disjointed with a podcaster because they have to either go to your website. It just is totally yeah. separate from any <laughs> having a place where people can talk unless they want to go and comment on the, but nobody uses these in-app stuff. Yeah, they don't I, use I, that. And I actually remember very recently I was asking somebody like, and literally where do I comment on, on like I'm an I'm Advert consumer podcast, but I can't find find it. Um, and so, yeah, it's it, it, as I said, the platforms for podcasting is is not where it needs to be. Okay, well, I'm excited that at least someone's paying attention to us. So, thank you for <laughs> that. And what sort of tips do you have for start? Because I know this is not your first startup, and that's what's amazing yeah. to sort of see um, the the history that you've had in general. So, how mm -hmm. how do you uh, strategize for something like this? You're like, okay, I know there's a need. Now, mm -hmm. did you get funding? Do you what do you do as the next steps? If you sort of walk me through. So we did. Um, Knowing there's a need and proving there a need is are quite different. And then, like like any entrepreneur, I'm probably, um, you know, I know I'm right uh, probably 100% of the time, and I'm probably right like 20% of the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's a period of time between you knowing you're right and you actually finding what is right. And so that's in tech, we always talk about product market fit. That can take quite a long time. Even with Fangio, um, we so we pivoted from uh, an earlier product uh, around April two thousand nine, and it wasn't really till November that we we probably had product market fit, but it maybe really took another year. And so it can take quite a lot of time to kind of get that, and 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 that's a process of iterating, talking to the customers, iterating the product, talking to the customers, and sort of getting there. So, um. Probably, if you ask for advice, the best, the biggest and most important thing I've seen is um, is really patience and persistence. Um, it's there's a danger always in that process of trying to overthink it and trying to over push it. Like a lot of times in startups, you have to do something. And then you have to be patient to see whether it works. <laughs> and then you have to like, say yes or no, it didn't work. And then you have to to sort of do the next thing. N nearly very few entrepreneurs I know have 
sort of no ideas. Like they don't, they're like, this is not working. I have no idea what to do. Like that, that very rare. It's usually more, they're doing lots of things. It's not clear what's working and their heads just totally frazzled with the stress of not knowing what's working and it's not working and they're really worried. And a lot of times I find that certainly for myself, it's like, okay, you just need to kind of step back, calm down a bit and sort of, sort of trust the process. And the process is this one of talking to customers, iterating the product and sort of moving your, your, your key KPIs, your key performance indicators in the right direction um, and not letting your kind of sort of your brain work against you. I love that you said that. I love that you actually give us real time frames because I feel like entrepreneurs are the least patient. And mm-hmm. as far as persistence go, we're like have ADD and want to like switch tracks over here yeah. if it's not yeah. working. So it's so, yeah. it's hard. How did you do it mentally? Yeah, yeah. I, impatience, I think, is a, is a good attribute. Um, you know, like you don't want someone like, ah, oh, just wait and see what happens. You know, you want someone who's like, no, I want things to change faster. I want them to improve. I want this to work. Um, how do you, um, and persistence obviously is a, requirement to be an entrepreneur because you you know things will go wrong 99 percent of the time and and that one percent of the time it's not that they went right they just kind of worked and then you sort of have to work on that so you need to have that persistence um in terms of sort of managing your sort of psychology i'm not i'm not sure i've got any really great answers there um like I think it's, I actually think it's as an entrepreneur, it, it, like it is important to have other things in your life. <laughs> I know that when certainly in, in our, um, you know, in our journey with Angel, like we were maniacally focused on it and like it worked, but it it was very tough. Um, I think when everything is 100% on one venture and you're not, you don't have time to step away. I actually even think it's bad for that venture like it's so for example i'm my new company i'm on the board of another company which is a totally different business and it gives me perspective of what it's like to be a board member it also just gives me some time to kind of step back and think about other problems so that i can come back just a little bit fresher and go actually i've had a i had a board meeting for another company a chance for me to think about that and when i come back to flick i look at it and i go you know what i'm thinking about this differently See, and that, I feel like startup culture, though, is like, but you have to be in at 127%. Yeah, because if you're yeah. not, then you're not dedicated. And, but yeah. I feel like that exactly what you said is true. So how do we balance what that is, especially for a newer entrepreneur that's like, I have to hustle? Yeah, I, you have to hustle. Um, you have to be like 100% committed. Um, but I, I do think there's importance of having other things going on and having other sort of interests that sort of sort of somewhat balance it and also just sort of manage the time like sometimes things just take a bit of time and you have to let it progress you know before you kind of then make your next decision yeah well it's an expectation thing right i always joke about how with clients and stuff it's how or end with me you think it's going to take this much time we'll double it and then maybe yeah, you're close right yeah. Uh, absolutely. It's so. What have you found, especially because you've grown something that's so massive? That did it ever feel like it wasn't growing very fast? Did you feel like your expectations were totally wrong? Like, tell me more about <laughs> that specifically. Yeah, like it's, you know, it's funny. So, Banjul is a multi-billion-dollar company, uh, but I, I like to tell people we were at least two years behind budget in our early years. <laughs> you know, so it was like we weren't even close. Um, and I remember like we just had series of budgets that we would miss. And it's because things just took a lot longer. And, and what I kind of keep pointing out to them is that this became a billion dollar business. We started in 2009, uh, sorry, 2009, and we became a billion dollar business in 2015. So this is six years. But we were still two years behind by, you know, by the end of year two, we were still like way back where we thought we would be. Like we were, you know, it took a lot longer and we still became a billion dollar business in six years. So like it's um, it's always good to remind people that like it, you know, like failing to hit your forecast is kind of the norm. Um, and that but that's not that doesn't mean that this is going to fail. It just means it's taking more time than you expect. <laughs> which is normal and you're not crazy. And the fact that you said that for a billion dollar company, I think is just a huge uh, key indicator for everybody to lighten the load a little. (laughs) 
yeah. for you yeah. too, right? Um, but when everybody's listening to this, aren't they going like, well, how did you miss those projections? You had the best team. You had the best people telling you what your expectations, quote unquote, you were, you did data beforehand. <laughs> how did you miss that? Yeah. Well, like in, in, in particularly in consumer tech, like Forecast, particularly, like I, so with Flick, I, I put together a cost forecast. I did not put together a revenue forecast. And if anyone ever asked for one, I would just say no. Um, because it was, it's a realm of fantasy, right? It's like, look, I can come up with numbers that you know, will make it look attractive, but I cannot for a minute pretend that that's, that I know that that's going to happen. Um, and that was the problem with Angel is that we, it was successful, but we had no way of knowing. And I, I just um, revenue forecasting in um, in a early stage uh, startup is almost always a complete waste of time. Um, forecast your costs. Assume you know if you're one of if you're revenue generating like some uh, some tech startups are not in the early years. Some are. If you are, make some assumption. But if you're spending more than half an hour or an hour on it you're kind of wasting your time. You should be doing something else. Like grabbing numbers. I think maybe one day it'll be like this and yeah. I'll be excited about that trajectory. Yeah, yeah. and then when- there's nothing to me when I'm, you know, I, I help a lot of early stage entrepreneurs and there's nothing that sh- looks more like a rookie mistake to me than somebody shows me their five-year plan and I just sort of laugh at it. And, you know, I'm like, I I hope you don't believe this because no one else is going to believe it. Like, it's um, it's not believable. Yeah. Um, Isn't that, I, I really appreciate you stating that out loud because a lot of new guys are like, look, I have a thing. And you're like, you made that really, up. I don't know what to yeah. tell you. <laughs> like, and, you know, I, I remember when I put together my budgets, I believed them. I really did believe them. And going out selling your business, you sort of feel that you have to. Um, but I think, and, and I'm hopeful that investors not, certain investors I talk to are much wiser about not sort of buying or, you know, what they would historically used to do is use the the forecast as a sort of cudgel to hit the entrepreneur with, which is, you missed your bud, you missed your forecast. They're like, everyone missed their forecast. And they kind of used to know that, but they would use it as a way to beat you up. Um, but now all the four, you know, investors I would talk to would, would even ask because they know that it's a ridiculous endeavor. So what are some common things that you tell these newer startup entrepreneurs that people need to know right now? Um, the, the things that I work with them on, um, I work them a lot on really refining their, their story and their vision um, uh, and understand that it changes. Um, so I work with them and sort of like putting together that narrative that they're going to talk to with investors I also work with them on sort of changing it and saying, like, I, I kind of want to understand, like, okay, what's your broad vision? But I understand that the actual execution or who the customer might be can really change in their in their journey. Um, so that's kind of one of the big things I work with them on. Uh, I really like to understand their culture and um, who their sort of co-founders are and and the sort of type of people they are and the type of the people they want to attract. Um, I, with a couple of them, I work on a lot on sort of hiring um, and say the sort of people they're looking to bring into the organization and how they select them and how they market them. Those are kind of the, some of the big things I work with them on. So like people and people and people. (laughs) Like, I mean. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so like a very, very simple one, and and, uh, this may be useful, a piece of advice I got years ago, probably one of the most useful pieces of advice as a CEO was there was only three things I needed to do, which I thought very liberating. There's only three. Everything else apart from these three can be outsourced to someone else. And in many cases, they should be. If you're doing things, if you're really busy and you're doing things outside of these three, then that's a really bad sign. But the three things that only the CEO can do and cannot be outsourced are raising money, hiring the team, particularly the top team, and setting the vision, right? Those are the three things that only you as a CEO can do. And if you're spending loads of time doing things outside those three, then you're probably doing something wrong. Like if you have raised money, then you should be hiring someone to do that. And if you've not raised money and you're doing those things, well, maybe you should be raising money uh, to help you to get someone else to do those other things. Now, you should be doing other things. You know, if you're an enterprise sales-led company, then you should be out selling customers. Um, If you're a product-led company, you should be spending time with your customers and your engineers. But if we go back to those three, 
first one, raising money. Only you can raise money, uh, particularly early stage. You know, in much later stages, you might work with a banker, but in early stages, only you can go out and sell people, convince people to give away their money in return for a stake in some some dream um, and that you're going to deliver it. Only you can do that. Um, only you can hire the, the very best people that you can get. Um, you can't really give that off to someone else. A recruiter's not going to do it. If you speak to any entrepreneur, they will say the very best people have always come through their own network um, as opposed to through recruiters. Uh, and then the, the third one is setting the vision. No one, no one else can set the vision. No one can else can sort of articulate where the product and the company is going. And so those are the three things you need to be doing. And, and it's, it's kind of liberating. You think, well, I only have to do those three things well. And I know CEOs are really good at doing those three things and they suck at everything else and they build very successful companies. And so that's the useful thing about it. Oh my God. And everyone's like wiping their brow going, okay, phew, at least I three things. That does, it makes it a lot more containable, right? At least easier. Absolutely. Give me some tips on visioning then, especially this is going to go live in January 6th in 2020 <laughs> and that everybody's going to be like 2020 vision. How long do you vision? Do you have any resources or books that you recommend? How do, how do you do it? Yeah. So we, it's, so visioning, I don't think as much of it as a process. I, I kind of think more of the for me, visioning is really getting to know the customers, getting to understand the area. Like so podcasting, I was fairly new to it, talking to lots of podcasters, uh, talking to listeners of podcasts, um, playing with all the different apps in the market, looking at what the tools are being used in esports. And then that sort of helped me kind of form a vision. But more important for me was sort of objective setting. So vision is kind of big and it can move around as well uh, as things develop and we find out that you know one set of users this product doesn't really work for and maybe we, we change the vision um but objective setting is more concrete so that we do on a quarterly basis and we use something called okrs um which is objective and key results uh, there's a book by john door out of, out at the moment about it it's very good really sets it out what i would say for any startup is put it in early um because uh, well, one, when you put it in early, you really get that, you get the benefit of it. And it basically says, what are we gonna do this quarter? And it's, it's actually quite simple. You basically just say three things we're gonna do this quarter and they have to be measurable, right? You can't have like, you know, you know, keep everyone happy or, you know, they have to be like, we're gonna sell this much. We're gonna score this on this match. We're gonna do this. And then the end of the quarter, you review it, and then you set your objectives to the next quarter. It's kind of as simple as that, but it's a really nice way at the end of the quarter of going, you know, okay, did we have a good quarter or a bad quarter? Because like a lot of things kind of change around, and you're like, okay, yeah, we did. We said at the start we were going to do this, and we managed to do it, or no, we didn't quite. Why did we miss it? Did we did we not work hard enough? Did we do the wrong things, or was it the wrong objectives? Um, so those OKRs are really important. The reason, the other reason I say do it early is with Fangio, we try to put it in later and it was murder. Like when, when you kind of have been running the company for several years in a different way, and then you say, now we need to do quarterly OKRs. I remember the first quarter, it took us a month. It took us three months to set our objectives <laughs> for the quarter. You know, like it was the very first quarter, like because they, they just felt it was such a huge process and no one wanted to sign up to anything. And so it was like the last day of the quarter, like here's objectives of the quarter and we hit them. <laughs> and then the next quarter, I remember we, I think we were better at getting them done, but we didn't even review them until the very end of the quarter. And so it took us probably well over a year to kind of get it in. And I thought this is terrible like we must be such a terrible organization and I spoke to a few other entrepreneurs and they said they had exactly the same experience like once if your company hasn't got it in it it's very hard to put that OKR process in yeah and to give everyone a break too because it, it sounds like oh it's not rocket science we should be able to get it like this and then our expectations are not aligned with how long it's going to take everybody to do it anyway yeah, right? get it in from day one it's a very simple process um, but it really just says what am I going to do in the next three months and then what am I going to do after that 
it's a very simple process. How do you decide what that, like, especially with the myriad of options that we potentially have yeah. now online, how do you actually uh, pare it down and prioritize them? Well, so the first good thing about OKRs is you really only are going to have three to five objectives. And so you're forced because normally the problem in most startups is there's so many things you can do and you never actually make that decision, right? You kind of go, uh, why don't we do both? And you end up kind of doing neither. So that's the first thing is it forces you to say, I can only have three to five objectives. Um, I think how we do it is we do sort of like we will have a, um, so for example, with Flick, uh, our ultimate, our, our biggest objective for this year is, is daily active users. That's our single metric that we focus on. And so we really um, look at the submetrics, what drives daily active users. And so it's things like new users, it's retention, it's new groups coming on board. And so that kind of helps us having that, you call it a bit of true north, a single metric that you're focused on. And then the OKRs are, what are the things that are going to drive that? What's the most important things? That makes sense. And it breaks it down and then you can get data from that and readjust as you're going along uh, anyway. Yeah. I love that. What What's the business model? Like if you're really, fo I get community, you have to focus yeah. on that side, but what is the yeah. business model? Do you have all that piece? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with a lot of these sort of community tools, like Facebook being the classic one, it, it's a, an advertising model. But as we can see with Facebook, there's lots of issues with that. And, um, and being, you know, people who've been in Facebook groups are like, you see what the issues going with Facebook, that's really driven by advertising. And the problem is that, you, if someone said, if you're not the customer, you're the product. And that's the case with, with Facebook. We, what we want to build is uh, the ability for uh, hosts and podcasters to build premium communities. So the product is largely free. Um, it's free to podcasters, and we want them to create large free groups. But what we want to say to them say, look, actually, some of you actually want more content, more engagement. And for that, that's going to be a premium experience. And we support that. And so what, we charge a platform fee and we process those payments. That's uh, our business. Okay, that makes sense then. Because I was going, hmm, how are we doing this in here too? And that's that's yeah. the thing. You're just, you're just the front end in that way. If they love you already, they're going to go with the, there's so many options to be going in that. And then you're in 17 yeah. different platforms anyway. So you might as well. Yeah. So like an example in the esports world, Twitch. Um, Twitch is a platform for game streamers, um, and if you love that streamer, you might uh, become a subscriber, you might tip them. Um, Twitch processes that and then passes uh, a percentage, you know, they, they, they pass it through to the streamer and they take a percentage as a platform fee. Dis uh, uh, for Flick, that's exactly the same, but we're working with podcasters. Yeah, so you'll be daily active users and then conversion to premium. <laughs> And yeah, so okay. what next year, what we're going to do is we will start to move to two metrics, which one will be user growth and the second one will be conversion to premium. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that I could predict it for you. That makes so much sense. Two things. That's it. Nice and easy. I love this. I know we have to start wrapping up because you have a hard uh, stop time, but what is one <laughs> action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Yeah, so I, I started thinking about this and it, it reminds me of a question I had last week when I was talking to university students who were in their 20s. Um, and so again, the bad news about that, the good news about this is uh, this is invaluable. <laughs> the bad news is it's very slow. <laughs> and, but, and, and then, but one writer that the good news about it is it's fun. And so the piece of advice that I gave them is invest in your relationships with the people you work with particularly the people you want to work with, not just for the next couple of days or months or years, but like for the rest of your career. Um, when I look back over my sort of 25 year career, I have had people who've, you know, where one stage was my boss and then, you know, they left and then I went and worked for them again, uh, or then some of them were peers and then I hired them to come and work for me or um, one case, a couple of them was my boss and then he became an angel investor in my next company. Um, and that has been invaluable to me. In fact, you know, with my team here um, uh, with Fleck, uh, so one of my, my co-founders, my co-founder in my previous company, uh, one of my key employees here worked for me at my previous company. Um, another company that I'm helping set up is uh, somebody who was just a mentee for a long time. and. Uh, we're actually going to start a company together. So investing in those relationships to me is, is, is a very, I think it's a very sure payoff. It's a very long-term payoff, but it's also 
you know, something certainly I enjoy doing. And, and I think that's the most valuable thing. Yeah, I think it's fun too. Awesome. Well, go. Mm-hmm. Now it makes us feel like we have ROI for the stuff that we like to do anyway. Yeah. So I yeah. appreciate that so much. Tell us where we find Flick, how we download it, make sure everybody yeah. gets on on board. Yeah. So uh, if you uh, on the App Store, if you search for Flick Chat, uh, you will find the uh, the app. You can find more about us at fleckapp.com. Um, and you can find more about me if you, uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm Nigel Eccles uh, on Twitter. We will definitely link everything up and let's make his his uh, daily active user metric go up. Come on, people, go, go download it right now. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really, really Thank appreciate you. it. If you enjoy this show, I would really appreciate your wonderful words of feedback. Go leave me a review. I would love a rating, whatever you can do in the time that you've got. I would so appreciate it.